Hi, everyone, and greetings from New Haven. I'm Henry Kwan with the Yale Alumni Association, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you joining us for this webinar program entitled Disability and Civil Rights, The Movement Continues. This program is brought to you by the Alumni Association and the alumni community as part of the Yale Impact Series. Without further ado, I'm delighted to turn this over to the moderators of our program. Thank you, Henry, and welcome everyone to this session of the Yale Impact Series. My name is Jenny Lerstein, and I am a member of the Yale class of 1978. My disability is blindness, and so I am going to take a moment to describe myself in case there are other viewers with vision impairments who can benefit from that description. I am a Caucasian woman, and I have curly brown hair and brown eyes. I am wearing a black sweater, and I'm accompanied, even though he's off camera, as always, by my beautiful guide dog Shiloh, who is a black male Labrador retriever. I live in San Francisco, and I'm a disability rights advocate. I send this over now to my co-moderator, Ben, for further introductions. Hello, I am uh, Benjamin Adolski. Um, for my appearance, I'm a white male. I have long, um, dirty blonde uh, COVID hair. Um, I have uh, wired frame glasses, green eyes, and I'm wearing a sweater vest with a, a gray sweater vest with uh, a blue and white Yale tie. I'm from uh, I'm Yale College, uh, class of 2018. Um, and I am one of the Yale Alumni Association Diversity Working Group uh, co-chairs. And to uh, pass it on from there, Sid, will you please introduce us first to yourself? Um, good afternoon, I'm Sid Wolinski. Um, I'm an average sized old guy um, my um, sole disability for the moment is um, I'm hard of hearing. Um, I live in uh, Berkeley, California. I'm lucky enough to do that. Um, and I'm a, um, uh, till I retired uh, uh, two years ago, uh, I was the co-founder of uh, uh, Disability Rights Advocates, DRA, and I was the um, uh, managing attorney of DRA. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Sid. Karen, will you go next, please? Sure. Hi, my name is Karen Nakamura. I got my PhD at Yale in 2001, and I miss the pizza greatly ever since. <laughs> I'm a genderqueer <laughs> Japanese American. Um, I am uh, sitting here in uh, North Oakland, California, with my San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind uh, t shirt, which shows various disability um, types in. Uh, and, and run bubbles and with the background of the 504 movement uh, in San Francisco in 1977 as my Zoom um, backdrop. I identify as having psychiatric and neurological disabilities and I'm here with my sex service dog, Momo. Thank you, Karen. Dr. O, will you please go next? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fermi Okunlami. I easily go by Dr. O. I use he, him, his pronouns. I like to consider myself a young to middle-aged black man with brown skin. I'm wearing dark rimmed glasses. I've got a black goatee. I wear a wooden bow tie, a blue collared shirt, a white medical coat with a block M representing Michigan on my right chest. In my background, you can see a colorful quilt, two plants, white walls, and some diplomas. I am currently the interim director of services for students with disabilities at the University of Michigan and the director of adaptive sports and fitness at the University of Michigan. Clinically, I'm an assistant professor of family medicine, physical medicine and rehab and neurology. And I serve as the disabilities issues representative to the group on diversity and inclusion at the Association of American Medical Colleges. I identify as disabled as a proud wheelchair user after experiencing a spinal cord injury in my third year of orthopedic surgery residency at Yale. Thank you, Dr. O. Janice, will you please go next? Hi, everyone. My name is Janice Ta, and I'm a member of the Yale Law School class of 2010. I'm currently a patent law attorney at Perkins Coie LLP, which is the law firm that's um, a West Coast law firm, but I have an office based in Austin. I live here with my husband, who is a linguistics professor at UT, and two kids. I identify, I, I identify as a person with disability because I had polio when I was six months old and had my leg lengthened when I was 18 years old and walked with a pair of crutches for almost 15 years. So I also have a lot of arthritis and um, back problems too. Before law school, I attended Stanford as an undergrad, um, majored in art history and human computer interaction. And I worked in the tech industry for three years, um, seeing the dot-com boom and bust. Um, and I started to end up getting bought by Comcast. Soon after I attended law school, 
where I was president of the National Association of Law Students with Disabilities. Um, and in my law firm career, I have really worked hard to mentor and create um, structures to diversify the law firms, wh whether it's founding the Women of Color Network at my previous law firm or doing advocacy for my um, women and minority attorneys. Um, I am I'm a short Asian woman, I'm about five foot one. I don't look like your typical um, white shoe law firm attorney. Um, I am also um, really short. I have, I'm an immigrant, a proud immigrant, the US came over here in 1978 um, amongst this enlightened group of panelists. Thanks everyone, this is Jenny um, speaking again. We're gonna kick off the questioning. As you can see, this is a very distinguished panel that has a lot of experience to share with us. I will ask each of you as you um, begin speaking, if you would kindly announce your name. It's another way that we can assist viewers with disabilities to identify who's speaking. Um, let's just kick it off with a one of the general questions, and I'll, I'll throw it out to all four of you. Um, and that has to do with uh, how the National Disability Rights Movement came into being and what it means. Uh, the Disability Rights Movement was born on the campus of UC Berkeley during the 1960s. And it is often referred to as the final frontier in the history of civil rights in America. What lessons can we take from the civil rights movement as we seek to nurture the development of this final frontier? And what does it mean for civil rights across America as we engage in the current pressing dialogue around equity? Who wants to go first? Um, if I can jump in, this is Karen. Um, this is such a fantastic uh, question. Um, I, I started working at UC Berkeley five years ago after uh, teaching 10 years at Yale. And it's really exciting to be here at, at the birthplace of the disability rights movement. Everywhere I look, I can see legacies. There's a little placard um, by the Berkeley BART station that says this is the first curb cut that was um, uh, cut by the rolling quads in the effort to make Telegraph Avenue more accessible um, and other streets more accessible. I can see Cowell Hospital. And at the same time, you know, a, a good, uh, gosh, is it 50, almost 40, 50 years has passed. And we see all of these disabled students now coming to campus. You know, all the work that people like Sid had put in um, in the 60s and 70s and other activists are all coming to fruition. I think every university in the nation is finding more and more disabled students um, uh, in, their, in their enrollments um, because the ADA has worked. We, we are seeing more and more disabled um, kids have opportunities that um, we didn't have to find um, resources that we could only have uh, dreamed about. And now they're coming to, to college. And I think the next big challenge is what, what lies after college. I don't think um, um, employment has caught up yet to, to the massive boom that we started. As someone, this is Janice Toth speaking, as someone who's really, I think, benefited from kind of everybody who's worked so hard in the disability rights movement, I, I want to, you know, one of the things I really want to touch on is kind of how difficult it is in some ways to organize a group as diverse and as multi-talented as what we have and multi-abilities that we have in the disability community. You know, I think in other civil rights movements, people have identities with either their gender, their sexuality, or their race, and their ethnicity. And I think it's much, you know, it takes a lot more dialogue in order to unite and bring together a disability rights movement and see it come in fruition. And we see that every day in the workplace. Um, for me, as an attorney with a very visible disability, I, I limp, I, I can't hide my disability. It's really easy for me to disclose to my employers that I, you know, what I need to succeed. I need, you know, accessible, physical accessibility. But I also know other attorneys who are not able to disclose in the same way that I am and don't have the benefit of being able to disclose, for example, um, their own learning disabilities or neurological disabilities that they, that, they, that they may have. And so I understand, you know, just what applies to me doesn't always apply to everybody else. And the assumptions that I make about my own disabilities don't apply broadly to other people, other people's disabilities. 
So I think, you know, being able to have a dialogue like this is really, really important across disability dialogue. I <clears throat> um, this is Sid Walensky, and I was lucky enough to be in Berkeley and be working uh, with the disability movement in Berkeley um, um, during the 60s and 70s. Um, and I am an unabashed advocate for lawyers. Um, I'm Yale class of 61, um, and um, there is no civil rights movement um, that has ever made great progress without litigators and without lawyers. Um, and there's no question that the key role is the role that, that has to be played by the community. Um, and what happened to the disability movement um, when it became a civil rights movement was um, exciting and wonderful because uh, disabled people, as we knew, um, were always the object of charity and pity and turning it into a civil rights movement meant moving it from a privilege um, to an absolute right. And I think that's a critical part of the movement. This is Dr. O speaking. Thank you to all of my fellow panelists for sort of bringing their perspective and framing this appropriately. You know, as the sole person of color on the panel, I want to just bring up sometimes a, an elephant in the room when people talk about equity. I, sorry, the sole BIPOC individual on this panel. So we have multiple people of color, but that actually speaks to what I think our nation does. When we talk about race, too often we think it's black and white only. We have binaries and many things that we discuss and not just race alone, but we could talk about in gender as well. And so I think many people, when they hear about the civil rights movement, at least in, in the circles that I tend to discuss things with, they think about black people. And right now, with many of the things that happened in 2020 around the killings of, of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, there's a reckoning with social justice that demonstrates the intersectionality of many marginalized groups. And the fact that, as Sid just said, this is a right, not a luxury. It should not even be considered a privilege. This is a right. And it's unfortunate that civil rights movements need lawyers to be able to convince the rest of the world that everyone should be valued. The fact that that is a case to be litigated is unfortunate. So I'm happy to then see that our country is seeing disability rights as civil rights and looking forward to then partnering with the individuals on this Zoom and other individuals around the country and world that have done the work long before I entered it. I entered the world only eight years ago into the disability community, but I've been a black man my entire life. And so now being multiply marginalized, as I like to say it, allows us to then recognize the intersectionality of the rights and needs that all of us have. And disability is that ubiquitous thread that cuts through all things. Thank you for that, all of you. And let's just take this uh, maybe just to the next level. Um, you've spoken about uh, multiple marginalization. Janice, you talked a little bit about the tremendous diversity that we see in our community. Uh, we also often describe the national disability community as being the biggest tent on earth because it is diverse in all aspects, regardless of age, race, gender, affiliation, geography, and definitely disability. So there is no one size fits all here. Um, can you tell us how your individual disability experience has shaped your lives and what it means to be part of this community in terms of this kind of intersectionality? If I can start again, this is Karen Nakamura. It's interesting to me because you know, psychiatric disabilities are hugely stigmatized within um, Asian American communities. Um, and so I never really, I, 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 it was something that I kept a, a deep dark secret and did not really come out about um, until, you know, I'm a professor at um, Cal and I, it was only until I wrote a book about psychiatric disabilities that I, I really came to realize just how much internalized ableism I had and internalized um, um, shame I had around having a psychiatric disability. 
And it was ironically also um, getting into a car accident and having a physical disability uh, for a while that made me realize just how different having an apparent disability was from having a non-apparent disability. And so it, it taught me a lot. And you know, I think the Asian American community, we need to really work on how we deal around stigma and disability. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on families because people often feel like it's the family responsibility, which often means that people with disabilities, you know, get sequestered and not shown, you know, not allowed to be in public. And so there's a lot of things that come up that I feel as a, you know, as an intersectional Japanese American uh, disabled person, let alone, you know, all the other uh, issues around being, being queer too. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I think we need to, there are, there are, it's a huge tent. I'm very proud to be part of these tents. I feel torn in a million directions and, and um, uh, but it is an exciting time because we finally are starting these conversations. For my part, I, I, I can speak. There are all these, um, I, I'm an immigrant. I introduced that early, early on. My parents grew up in Vietnam. We were boat people. I was born in a refugee camp 10 days after my parents landed. My mom had no idea that she was eight and a half months pregnant, a long pregnant. And I, I was just born on the beach underneath a plastic tarp. You know, I have benefited. I, she, my parents grew up in a country where neither of them got more than a formal graduate, uh, grammar school education because their parents were too poor to be able to support them. I grew up not taking those things for granted. My mom told me how, you know, when she was a child, she has a brother with a disability. And to have, um, in Vietnam, one, you know, most, par most parents wouldn't have even given their children the opportunity to have an education if they had a disability. Um, nor would they have had an opportunity not just to get educated, most of them ended up, you know, wouldn't get married and have, be able to have a family. I grew up, you know, I, growing up in the United States has been so life-changing in some ways, right? It's, and it's, it's an opportunity that, you know, just some path that diverged in my life that somehow we ended up here growing up in Texas. I contracted polio, but I was able to get medical care um, when I was in Dallas and um, under, uh, under ch basically charity and grew up in inner city Dallas where, you know, not very many, I looked very different from other, the other people who live there. I've always looked different than uh, most other people who live in Texas. And, you know, I always had the, you know, knowledge and perception that I was different. And I have to say that, you know, part of that, when you compound that with all the other, you know, being female, being an immigrant, being Asian, um, having a disability, it really, you, you have to think through, you know, how do you, what kind of resilience, what kind of, you know, how do you, how do you build your own self-esteem? How do you build your own confidence in your own abilities? And it was really when I went to college um, that I discovered who I was, that I was not ashamed that I have parents who don't speak English, who dedicated their lives to, and sacrificed their lives so I can go have an education, that I was not ashamed that, you know, I didn't learn to speak English until I was in the second or third grade, that I was not ashamed to wear a skirt or wear a dress and show my, the leg brace that I wear. So, you know, it, I realized it took time for me to kind of build that pride in my identity. Um, and having that opportunity, you know, one of the things that really helped me was being exposed to seeing images of people with disabilities and the diversity of our community. And I would encourage all of us who have the opportunity to build that image and build those communities to continue to do so and identify proudly. This is Dr. O. Thank you, Janice. You know, I'm gonna build on sort of that story of the, the immigrant experience you had. So I was born in Nigeria. Both of my parents, however, were physicians before they even came over to the States. And we then came from Nigeria to Maryland where they ended up having to redo their residency and they did it at Howard University in pediatrics. And then my mom did her fellowship in pediatric intensive care at Johns Hopkins. And my dad did his fellowship in neonatal intensive care at Georgetown. We then moved to the Midwest and I can tell you that my parents having lived in Nigeria where most people looked like us, they did not experience what they felt was racism. And so when things would happen to them here, 
they would never think that it was solely based on race that someone may be discriminating against them. And so I was then brought up to then believe that while perfection is not possible, excellence is something you can strive for. And the one thing that our parents made sure that we understood was the value of education. And so I went through with the understanding or belief that if you worked hard and if you did the right thing, that then you would get what you sort of worked hard for. Also with a faith basis to say that as a Christian believer, we know that the Lord is ultimately in control and we truly don't actually deserve any of the things that we are given in terms of material things. But I always went along feeling like hard work pays off. Now I say this because many people in this country that look like me in terms of race haven't necessarily had that same experience here. And so our own connection to sort of civil rights and social justice and racism was somewhat disconnected as African immigrants to the States and not necessarily being seen as African Americans. But I will say that the first time I truly felt what it was like to be excluded, to be marginalized, to be discriminated against was after having my disability. And I say that that's when I experienced life on the other side of the stethoscope because I'd been taking care of patients with disabilities for years, but I failed to recognize the rights that were being withheld from an entire population that we like to see as the, the biggest minority group we have, given the true intersectionality. Of it. <laughs> and so what that framework provided me was I was actually very angry because I thought if we fought all of our lives to then be seen as equal as black people, and now I get to a point where I have this two hit phenomena where I'm black and disabled, that I recognize that my story and my experience was not unique because there are many multiply marginalized people and their identities in this country that are not viewed as equal. And so the way that I really see this intersectionality of the tent that then disability does is rather than creating silos, it actually creates groups of individuals that recognize that the things that they are advocating for, while the person that looks like you may not be the only person that experiences life the way you do, and that we are better together to then galvanize the resources and support to then create a society, a community, a country, a world that then values everyone and provides the equity that people need to feel valued and thrive in whatever it is that they set their heart out to do. This is Jenny, thank you so much for that. Uh, ben, you wanna take it from here? Yes, so we're gonna move on to the uh, specific individual questions. I wanna make a note that after the question is asked of the person, um, it's open to the rest of the floor. So I encourage you to jump in afterwards um, and add your piece to it. So our first question here is gonna to go to Janice. Um, you're the uh, one of our, you're our only panelist uh, who grew into adulthood with the protections of the ADA. How has this shaped your experience and what gaps do you see that we need to address in order to achieve full inclusion for Americans with disabilities? Thank you, Ben. I wanted to start with kind of referencing back to what Dr. O was talking about, how important the ability to have an education is, right? We have, I, so of course I grew up, I, I was 12 years old when the ADA passed. Um, and I, during that time, I didn't realize how difficult it was for other people who have disabilities to get, be employed. Now that I'm an adult and have, and, and have more exposure, I see what it, you know, how hard I had to work and how few people are actually still in the professions that I've chosen. So just as an example, I, you know, I've had so many diverse experiences, whether being a tech being a, a, a software developer or a tech person to now being an attorney. These, you know, two different professions and, see, and seeing two different cultures and how they deal with people with disabilities. I don't take what I have for granted. I'll start with the law. Um, at my law firm, for example, um, it's an international law firm but of about 1,200 attorneys. Only 4% of people identify, attorneys identify as people with disabilities. That is actually six times higher than the normal stats for lawyers. In general, only 0.65% of attorneys identify as people with disabilities. Um, part of that is an identification and disclosure issue, but part of that is that there haven't been structures to allow people with disabilities to be able to pursue a very, very demanding um, job that, you know, requ it, that requires not just our mental abilities, but 
just even physical abilities to be able to carry out what, what we do and work, you know, 70, 80 hours a week and not have that type of fatigue and deal, you know, so there are lots of structures that I think both law firms and the tech worlds can build in to allow people with the, with the ability to be strong attorneys to participate as fully as they can. Um, one example is at my previous firm, for example, they had a website out that said that the firm valued diversity and they talked about you know, race, they talked about gender, they talked about um, um, uh, LGBT d d d um, diversity, but when they got to disability, they didn't talk about disability in the context of employing attorneys. Mm -hmm. They talked about disabilities in the context of employing staff, implying that you know, they didn't expect there to be people with disabilities who would be attorneys at their firm. Now, I went in and, and said, that language just has to change. You know, you're excluding me as an individual. You know, when I think through what it would, what it would take to kind of build, um, build a, a stronger, uh, more inclusivity, yeah, perhaps in my profession or even beyond, it's, I think through exposure, I think through identification, building awareness. Um, in some ways, I, I talk proudly about my disability and at work, I'm able to, you know, I, I discuss my disability in the context of what it would take for me to succeed and not what my limitations are. So I demand that my workplace gives me structures so I can have a family, so I can work as many hours as I can, so I can work remotely when I need to, so I have the flexibility to go visit my doctor when I need to, so I can have a workstation that's ergonomically, you know, valuable to me. I realize I'm in a profession that has, that can provide all of that. But not all professions, not all companies can do that and not all places can do that. And we need to get to a point where we can. We also need healthcare. I am such in such a precarious state with my own employment. If I can't, if I can't have employment, I don't have healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that's really problematic, especially for people with disabilities to not to be forced to be in professions or in, in, in situations where you're working not for your own dignity or not for your own um, you know, wish to work, but really just to have health care so that you can be supported. Um, so I'm really, really, you know, I think the more we can expand universal health care in the US, the more important it is. And Dr. O, you can speak better, better on that point than I can. Um, and then, you know, just in our day-to-day, -day, how do we deal with um, the structures of being conscientious about other people with disabilities? My own law firm actually has a cross-disability um, group. I meet with about 12 attorneys every month and we just, we talk. Um, but I also think through conferences that we have. All our conferences, you know, I try to make sure are fully accessible, whether there's a person with disability or not. So the conferences and meetings that we throw, just like you would ask somebody, do you want a meat or veggie option on your plate? You know, we ask, I demand that our firm ask whether, you know, there are accommodations that could be made for people with disabilities. And that's something that we can all demand, not just for ourselves, but for our coworkers. Um, so, you know, I'm giving you this all in the context of my workplace and, you know, I'm not, in some ways, I, 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 I wish that I could be more involved, but my advocacy really comes from being, um, being somebody who is out in the world and working with people who have no perception that I have a disability um, until they meet me. And so it's really, you know, as much work that I can do to mentor others and to build that movement within the law, law firm community, I'm really, I, I hope I can do even more. Thank you, Janice. And you know, those are two, uh, that's a phenomenal example um, and two really important issues, um, especially in the context, you know, we touched on earlier, you know, with colleges and universities, the ADA is, is helping and improving, um, getting students, you know, it's not necessarily getting us to the workplace, which is that next step that we need to get to. And that's where we have to break down barriers. So really, really great example and appreciate that. Does anyone else have something they'd like to add or they think uh, might have been uh, that we could go further on? All right, I think we'll move on uh, to our next individual question. Sid, um, your career spanned the decades before, during and after the passage of the ADA. Tell us a little bit about your experience in promoting disability rights through the movement and where you see the ADA's greatest success and failures. Okay, well, um, this was Sid Walensky, and um, you're right. Um, um, I started to litigate um, uh, disability rights cases um, at 
public advocates, a firm that I had co-founded before I moved to Disability Rights Advocates. And um, uh, we started in 1972, 1973. <clears throat> and the reason that we were able to litigate them is because um, there was a actually a rich fabric of statutory rights in California, even though it was not elsewhere. So California has uh, Civil Code 51, which is um, the UNRWA Civil Rights Act. Um, and um, it also um, in 1992 included all disabilities. Um, it has the um, Disabled Persons Act um, which is Civil Code 54.1. Um, and then there were also some federal statutes. The ADA did not um, replace those statutes. We had IDEA. We had Section 504, if you had a right against um, the federal government. Um, and so um, I, I was kept busy litigating. Uh, we had enough to do. Um, uh, but then the ADA really, really did add a, an additional dimension. And that included the following. Um, first of all, it gave national coverage and far more uniformity. So, you know, we were happy litigating in California, but nobody was happy litigating in Mississippi or Texas. And the ADA gave that na national coverage. Um, related to that, um, even here in California, the ADA enabled you to get into federal court. Um, and it's not unusual in every state um, for the federal court judges and the federal court system to be superior to the local system and to be uh, more impartial and not subject to um, political pressure. So. Um, even in California and other states where the law was pretty good, um, the ADA suddenly gave us the choice of being able to get into federal court. Um, a third thing that um, the ADA did um, is the passage of the ADA became a rallying point for the whole disability community. And in a sense, it really brought it together to have cross disability basis for assertion of civil rights. And um, finally, as we all know, um, it really, really heightened awareness um, of disability um, as, as a civil right. Um, so um, the ADA importance is the um, importance of the ADA is not uh, to be underestimated in any way, um, but I think it would be inappropriate to not talk about some of the limitations of the ADA. Um, um, what it lacked the most were, and this is my favorite subject, lawyers to enforce it, all right? The ADA is not self-enforcing. Um, and um, uh, there aren't enough lawyers doing disability rights work and there aren't enough disability lawyers with disabilities. Um, and uh, in this August uh, company here, I cannot help but say, the Yale Law School um, does not have an enviable record in this regard. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a gathering of Yale Law alumni and the Dean was there and um, I asked her, cause we were trying to we would kill to get a good lawyer from Yale uh, with a disability. And she could only identify one, there may have been more, but she could only identify one uh, student at that point with a disability at Yale Law School. And it's something the law school has not done um, enough of. Um, you know, I had a very personal professional um, example of um, uh, why we need more lawyers when disability rights advocates about 10, 12 years ago opened its New York City office um, in addition to the main office at Berkeley. Um, and the cases that, um, uh, what happened in New York was that there were really powerful, good um, centers for independent living. Um, 
uh, Brooklyn Center for Independence for the Disabled, Harlem Center for Independence for the Disabled. Um, I mean, really good organizations, but for some reason or other, lawyers weren't doing these. And so in the first years of the New York office, we were able to bring lawsuits on access to the subway system, um, where 80% of the subways were inaccessible. We brought a um, successful lawsuit um, on taxi cabs, only 2% of the taxi cabs, the yellow cabs were accessible. Uh, by the way, they're now moving toward 50% after that, um, um, after that lawsuit. Um, only 3% of um, uh, signaled intersections had audible pedestrian uh, signals. Um, we had to bring a lawsuit on access of disabled people to disaster planning, uh, which is becoming more and more important. Um, we had to bring lawsuits on access to hospitals. And all this is after 2010, that is 20 years um, after the ADA had passed. You know, we brought the first lawsuit against Kaiser 20 years before we uh, brought the lawsuit against um, Beth Israel um, in New York City because there just weren't enough lawyers. Um, now, for the ADA itself, um, 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 I have to say I, I, I have a wish list. I don't um, um, blame the drafters of the ADA who did a fantastic job, but some weaknesses of the ADA are it of course did not foresee the internet and therefore it required years of litigation because it wasn't clear whether the internet was um, uh, covered to um, my uh, former and wonderful law partner and friend, Larry Paradis, um, really did a good job in gaining access to the internet, but that took a long time. Um, the ADA, as I think you all know, does not have a damages provision that's a huge omission, but of course, it's, it was a political issue. Um, and uh, just so everybody was really aware of this, most observers think that the ADA, although fabulously successful in many aspects of it, um, has not done the job it should in terms of um, employment. Um, so I end up with um, being a big booster for lawyers um, I should also add, um, not only would I hope that more lawyers would take on this, these cases, but the, the disability community itself, um, I think, can uh, make a, a lot of progress by putting pressure on state attorney generals, all right? Um, um, you know, I have to say, um, under Jerry Brown, um, we had a pretty active um, state administration that pursued civil rights for people with disabilities. Um, and also many, um, many um, uh, cities and localities such as New York have a human rights law and you can put pressure on city attorneys. And it's just a great way to leverage um, disability rights cases. And uh, finally, um, there's of course the Justice Department and there was a notable lag under the Trump administration um, in enforcement of civil rights by the Justice Department. I hope we can try to remedy that in years to come. This is Dr. O. Thank you, Sid. And I'm going to piggyback on something you said and put it together with a phrase that someone said to me recently. So I was a, a visiting professor at UCLA and gave a couple of talks to some of their leadership. And one thing that we have in, in medicine is called the LCME, which is essentially the accrediting body to then allow academic medical centers to then continue <laughs> doing the work that they're intended to do. One of the senior leaders at this institution said to me, and this was not his belief, but this is what he feels that people do. He said that people do not care about what is expected. They care about what is inspected. And I think that ties well to what you said about there not being enough lawyers that are then carrying out the work of the ADA. 
But I, I will actually say that while this isn't challenging your position, I actually challenge our society because it should not take a law that then is then enforced to then have individuals value their neighbor. And so if that is where we are, where we will continue to put up barriers for people, if there's not a lawyer or a police officer or some sort of inspector enforcing civil rights, then I think that to go back to the question that was asked of Janice earlier, I think that what's needed is the change in stigma and perception of what disability actually is. Because if we saw each other as equal, if we saw each other as every man, woman being is created equal, then it shouldn't then require that there's an enforcer to have you treat your fellow human equally. And so when I look at this, even though you know, the ADA was something that you know, was in existence before I entered the world of disability, I at times don't look at this as any sort of limitation or flaw in the ADA. This is really something that should just be used as a benchmark to then start a conversation for people that don't know how they can increase accessibility for their fellow human, to say, these are the things that you should consider and this is merely the floor. But it is incumbent on each individual and I tell people to work within the sphere of influence that they have, because while not every individual thinks they can change the world, they can change the way that they interact with their neighbor. They can change the way that they are inclusive of other people. And I say to people that the past may not be your fault but the future will be. So when you are then faced with the understanding that there are individuals in our country and world that don't have the same access that other people have, what are you going to do about it? You have the ability to create a world that is accessible and inclusive of all people. And just because you didn't recognize what inaccessibility looked like yesterday, doesn't mean that you need a lawyer to enforce accessibility tomorrow. I want to just add a, a short note for the, the Yaleys watching this. Right now, we are 30 years past the ADA, and the employment rate for disabled persons has actually gone down since prior to the ADA. Um, so we have not been able to do enough. And one can say maybe the ADA wasn't strong enough. I, I know it wasn't strong enough for some categories, especially psychiatric disabilities. Um, we can say maybe the Supreme Court um, wasn't educated enough because the Supreme Court very early on watered down in a series of decisions, watered down the ADA employment portions to where they were essentially useless. Um, and maybe that's, that was up to us at, at Yale to say, to tell the Yale, because so many Supreme Court justices come out of uh, Yale law to better educate them of exactly what disability is. Um, perhaps it's the prejudice in, in society. Uh, some employers, especially small ones, are hesitant to hire disabled people because they unfairly see them as litigious. Um, and one can assign a lot of blame, but um, it is, I think, the thorniest problem. I mean, but it's one that we share, I think, with both the Black civil rights movement and the feminist civil rights movement. In those cases where a good, you know, 70, 100 years passed um, those movements and, and we still with this question of how do we, as Dr. O say, just be able to see each other for the humanity that we have um, and recognize us for the skills that we can bring without also carrying all that, that prejudice with us. But I think it's the work of people such as Sid over the, the past 60 years that have brought us so incredibly far um, in this nation. Sid, I, I wanted to address one of the things that you raised about Yale Law School. I took one Yale Law School disability rights course and we did a lot of reading. What was surprising was none of the literature we read was written by somebody who identified as a person with disability. And, you know, this is a full semester course and I couldn't imagine, for example, taking a class about, um, LGBT rights or black history or women's rights and have not, no text that we read written by women or LGBT um, identifying authors or, you know, and it was, that was what it was. I raised that issue in a class that why do we not have literature written by people with disabilities, you know, for this class? 
and there's there really is a blind spot to some of some of these issues. And um, I, I one question I wanted to direct at you was thinking through why do you think it is that, for example, the movement and the momentum for the LGBT rights has was able to consolidate so much quicker than you know just the civil rights movement that has been in action for decades. I, can I say it's not a, a comment as as yes no as I wanted to ask a question of, of the panel. Oh and, oh. As the previous chair of LGBT studies at Yale, I can say it's because a lot of gay men uh, graduated from Yale, went to New York and became lawyers, uh, doctors and um, bankers and made a heck ton of money and were able to pour that money back into the community, especially after the AIDS epidemic. And they realized that you can't just make money, you have to fund the movement. But because they could pass in those in those professions and because they could make a heck ton of money, it, it, it enabled the LGBT movement to do things that I think were difficult for other movements uh, to do. And that's my honest truth. Ben, your mic is off if you're talking to us. This is Jenny. Can you hear me? Have we lost Ben? Well, we can hear you, Jenny. We can't hear Ben. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Am I back? Okay. Uh, thank you. That you know that was a excellent discussion on there. You all touched on some very uh, important issues um, within the realm of the ADA. Um, honing back to employment uh, being a major struggle, um, and, and especially in comparison to other movements, why hasn't the display rights movement gained as much traction, especially within the 21st century, um, as it did in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, Sid, I think you're absolutely right on the amount of lawyers and people involved to litigate um, and helped enforce these protections and also help promote more protections for people with disabilities. And Dr. O, I think that the um, interplay between stigmatization and the um, the ability for people to you know love their neighbor and say like we're not going to treat people this way um, is very important. And I think you have to have a mixture of both um, to change culture and change how people are seeing the world um, to get them uh, into the right frame of mind. Um, so I think uh, very fruitful um, discussion there. Uh, moving on to our uh, third question, it's back to you, Dr. O. Um, you have acquired, uh, you acquired your disability at a time uh, when you were entering a highly competitive profession um, that to this day excludes people with disabilities. Um, talk to us about the intersection of disability and the medical profession, race and any other equity issues um, as you have advanced throughout your career. This is Dr. O. Thanks, Ben. You know, this is actually an interesting question because you talk about my profession as, as a physician and how we still exclude individuals with disability. We talk about the intersection of medicine and disability. And that to me, it, it's almost redundant because I feel as though if the medical community is not intimately connected to disability in a way that they understand it and they are the ones able to better frame it. Now, we all are probably familiar with the medical model of disability versus a social model of disability. And I think that if we continue to perpetuate this medical model of disability being some sort of ailment that needs to be rectified as some sort of deficiency in an individual, then I think that is where the medical field is actually failing. Mm -hmm. So I would love for the medical profession to be the profession that has a higher percentage of individuals who identify as having a disability because we recognize that we are all human. We see the incidence and the prevalence of all of the things that cause disability that we take care of in patients, but we need to recognize that not every person with a disability should be seen as a patient. And therefore this interplay, the intersection, and then quite frankly, the line in the sand that we draw between patient and provider is I think part of this problem. Because after I then, as I said, entered the world on the other side of the stethoscope is when I saw how our own profession treats individuals with disabilities. I saw how we pathologize this and make it something that is a negative but then I entered this world of sort of disability justice and disability culture and met plenty of people who identify proudly as being disabled and the fact that this should then contribute to diversity. Disability should not be seen as an inability, which is why then I have that catchphrase disabusing disability, 
to demonstrate that disability doesn't mean inability. But the ableist framework that medicine perpetuates by making people feel as though they have to be perfect, that in even any other space, not just disability related, if any physician shows vulnerability or shows that they don't know something, the cancel culture that we have and the ableist framework that medicine perpetuates tells that student that they're in the wrong profession, that they might wanna reconsider. And so if that's what physicians perpetuate, that's what physicians do, echoed by an article that recently came out by Dr. Lisa Iazzoni and some of her colleagues that referenced the fact that physicians, when asked about the quality of life of individuals with disabilities, physicians categorically thought that the quality of life was lower than the individual themselves. The reason that this is important is because we make decisions about how we are going to then provide care based on the perceived quality of life that this person has. And so I felt it firsthand when my own colleagues thought that my life was no longer of the same quality than it was prior to my injury and my disability afterwards. People that thought, oh, it's so sad. He had so much promise. And now I wasn't expected to be able to contribute in the same way. So I say, yes, medicine, I think could be much more responsible for the way that we discuss disability. I give talks to pediatrics residencies, obstetrics and gynecology, where I tell them that the way we even discuss it and frame it as breaking bad news when we tell a mother or a, an expecting parent that their child will then be born with a disability automatically sets that family and child up of a world where they're not expected to be able to achieve or accomplish anything. Hmm. Now, the truth is that the built environment does not support that they will be able to do the things that we know they can do. And so it's a twofold thing. We need the structures in place to be more accessible we need to dismantle the ableist frameworks upon which we then live. And we need to support people to then know that no matter what disability you have, it is not your fault. You are not wrong. You are not less than. And that is something that whether we're talking about race, ethnicity, gender, disability status needs to be perpetuated in all spaces of our work. Because the other particular part that I am this impassioned about now is I had the opportunity to be a division one NCAA athlete where I was able to be afforded all of the benefits and perks that came with that. And when I then continued through my career and I saw that there were student athletes who were Paralympic level athletes that were not given the same access as their non-disabled peers, that is a stark contrast from the way that we treat non-disabled individuals. And that is just one subset of the disability community. That is just one subset of any marginalized group to see the disparity between the haves and the have nots. And so athletics, medicine, we can all do a much better job of destigmatizing disability, of recognizing that we are intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, but very often intentionally excluding people on the basis of something that does not determine the quality of their life or the quality of their work. And so instead of judging and limiting people by what we think they cannot do, what we need to do is to provide people with the access and the opportunity to demonstrate to us in the world what it is that they can do. Absolutely. <laughs> can you hear me again? Can you still hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rowe. Uh, this has been, uh, no, you're absolutely right. And, and it's, if you asked the majority of people with disabilities, if their quality of life is any worse, they'd say absolutely not. And, uh, you know, we see with uh, COVID is a prime example, um, you know, with rationing care and doing things like that, uh, forcing people with disabilities to sign DNRs or, you know, getting their guardians or whoever to do that. Um, you're, you're making judgment calls for people and not allowing them to have control of their lives. Um, and ultimately that is um, detrimental. I actually just got out of the hospital uh, having surgery on my foot, orthopedic surgery, and they weren't focused necessarily on my surgery that I had had. They kept going back to my disability and wanting to figure out like if, if that was, you know, everyone was shocked that I was a paraplegic the whole time. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm here for my foot. This is what I'm, you know, it has nothing to do with my disability. Uh, and so, um, you know, the medical profession and disability and when you go to, even when you go to a hospital, they're not made for people with disabilities. They're not accessible. You know, you go to some older hospitals and there's not even, a, say, a roll-in shower if you're a wheelchair user. And it's like, this is unacceptable. Um, and I think that that is a really good point about the interconnection between the two um, and how important of a role it plays. So thank you, Dr. O. 
Um, moving on to our uh, last specific question, um, Karen. As one of the few academic scholars teaching the history and substance of disability rights, especially in an international context, uh, you have a unique perspective about how secondary education may affect the development of the disability rights movement. How does the United States compare to the international community on disability rights? And what do you think our academic institutions should be doing to enhance forward motion for people with disabilities? Thanks, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I had the, the great privilege of, of teaching at Yale from 2005 to 2015 when uh, UC Berkeley stole me away to um, become the Haas Distinguished Chair in Disability Studies. And I could see in that 10 year time when I was at Yale, just the amount of change that was possible that I had previously mentioned that the ADA generation is coming of age. And you have all of these students who have been enabled by the ADA, by the IDEA to get an education. They were no longer sequestered in you know, um, uh, special schools for the disabled or the handicapped. They were mainstream. They got um, the education that every other child deserves. And they, they managed to come to great institutions like Yale because of that. But when I was teaching disability studies classes at Yale, I had so many students come out to me um, and mostly with non-apparent disabilities. They might've been getting um, some, some help in, in um, high school or middle school, but they come to Yale and they have no disability identity. Um, they might have Tourette's or dyslexia or ADHD. Um, and they have the least notion of what the disability movement was about and, and, um, and ended up in my class where we talk about these issues. And it's much like Jen has said, you know, um, that was the first opportunity to really learn. And in my case, I did try to really fill it with um, um, knowledge of the, of the pioneers, of the people who led the various disability rights movements, the movement to have ASL recognized as a language, the 504 movement, the ADA movement, um, and all the things that were possible. Um, New Haven has a very long history as really being one, the place where ASL was born because of, um, of um, uh, Lawrence Clerk and um, um, Gallaudet who came to um, New Haven to, uh, to um, and Alice Cogswell, all these uh, key people in, in deaf history passed to New Haven and, and Yale uh, played, or at least New Haven played a huge role in that. And nobody knows these stories or they're very much hidden. Um, we don't have a, a disability history month. And so um, that's commonly taught in schools. And so, so many, um, uh, kids are taught that they only have an impairment or that they shouldn't talk about their disability. Um, and, and there's no disability pride. I, I really worry. I think one of the things that the United States did really well was we made such leaps in the 80s and 90s with disability rights, um, but we forgot to teach about it. And as a result, the college kids now, they don't, they don't know that. And so it's, it's become incumbent on us to really try to increase the number of disability studies programs, to try to get more curricula out there, to write more books, to tell more stories. Um, Yaley should definitely watch a film on Netflix called Crip Camp. It talks about the importance of a summer camp for um, disabled kids um, called Camp Jeanette. Um, in the, six, uh, in the 60s and 70s and really helping formulate a whole generation of kids that have a really strong positive identity as being disabled. They saw other kids like them. They had a summer experience where just being disabled was normal and seeing other kids with disabilities was normal. But the gap between that and then going back home to the Bronx or somewhere else where it's just like, oh my God, you know, I can't even get into school because somebody has to carry me up a flight of stairs. What is this gap? I need to do something about this. That's what enabled the movement. And right now, I think we still, we need to fire up that next generation 
of, of, of students and then scholars to be that next, to be the leaders, to be the lawyers, to be the tech workers, to be the professors, um, and to say, this is not right. You know, as, as a, a disabled scholar, one of the few disabled scholars, I have um, incredible, incredible survivor guilt because at every stage of my career, I've seen brilliant people uh, drop out of college. I've seen brilliant people drop out of grad school. Uh, I've seen brilliant people drop out of trying to get their job as with a PhD. And brilliant people drop out of as, being a, an assistant professor, not getting tenure or not even surviving the third year mark because academia is incredibly ableist. I think it's one of the most ableist institutions. Um, you know, the undergrads at, at uh, UC Berkeley, about 10% of our students are disabled. And I think it's about, you know, it might be about seven or eight at Yale. It's not as high, uh, but um, that's a huge percentage. That's really great. It, it almost corresponds to what we would expect, one in 10. Um, but when you get to professors at UC Berkeley, the home of the disability rights movement, 1.5% of professors identify as having a disability. It's great. It's twice the number of lawyers, right? <laughs> According to Janice's statistics, twice the percentage for lawyers, but 1.5. And I know that a fully 1.3% of that are uh, people who have um, are identifying as such because of age or other reasons and, and are not people who are coming, starting their careers identifying. And this is at the home of the disability rights movement. So the, we still have so much more to do. The US has been an incredible leader in disability rights. And much of it has been because of, of, of Yaleys over the multiple generations. And I think we need to you know, figure out how we can rekindle that. Um, I'm, I'm super proud to, to be a Yale. I love that the story of UC Berkeley is tied into um, Yale because Yale blue is also UC Berkeley's yellow and blue because Yaleys helped found UC Berkeley. They brought the blue from the East Coast to the West Coast and mixed it with the California sun to make the yellow and blue. Um, <laughs> but I think we, we can also bring that, that, that blue spirit um, and shine across the world. But we, we really need to, to have this generation again that is saying this is not right. It's not right that we don't have access. It's not right that so many colleges at Yale are utterly inaccessible. I had a friend um, when I was teaching at Yale visit me to give a talk. She was one of the founders of the disability rights movement. We only found one college that had an accessible guest house, one college. And, and y'all know, right? The, all the colleges have guest houses so you can have tea with, with prominent people, but only one college had one. And it was still such a struggle, such, mm -hmm. such a struggle. So the two new colleges are more accessible, which is really great, but still we could do a whole, a whole lot more. And I, I'm, I'm confident, I mean, Yaleys are the most growing group of people on, on this world and we can get there, but we, you know, we, we have to awaken to our pet potential. Absolutely, absolutely. This is Jenny, can you hear me? Yes. I, I'm just going to remind everyone that we, we've got a little ways to go yet, and uh, this discussion has been remarkable. Um, but there is one final question that I would really like for us to have a little time to spend on together and ask each of you to think about and briefly comment on. Uh, we've talked a lot about the community. 61 million Americans are challenged by disability. That's about uh, one in five. Americans and with the way that the global pandemic is reshaping the world, that number will definitely um, be exponentially greater as we come to what we hope will be the end of this difficult period in world history. Um, we have talked a lot about how far we've come in America and around the world. This last year in July, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. As we look forward towards ADA 50, my question to all of you is what do we need to do in order to ensure equity and inclusion in society as we move toward ADA 50? Can I have uh, I'll, I'll, Okay, go no, ahead. I'll, I'll start, I'll start. Um, this is Janice. Um, I, 
you know, I really kind of thought through one of the things that we haven't touched on yet is this concept of allyship <laughs> and how important it has been for all these other movements, for LGBT rights, for um, civil rights based on race, for everything else. And it's, I find it's hard to build allies in a movement where most people are not even educated about disability rights history, right? We don't have, like Karen had mentioned, I have two kids, five and seven years old. I do the, every year I come and present on Lunar New Year, and every year I come and present on disability rights because nobody else is gonna be teaching it, right? And with, if we don't teach it, we don't build um, allies. We can't build people who can speak on our behalf. And, and not, not that we need people to speak on our behalf. That's not what I meant. We need, we need allies uh, and we need people who will step in, whether it's for funding, whether it's for um, com community building, and, or whether it's just for us telling our stories and having people who are in, 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 in places where they can help us tell our stories, that that's made accessible to us. And so I have, you know, like just open it up later on, maybe people can discuss how we can build allyship that's not just within the movement, but outside of it too. Yeah, if I can jump on, this is Karen Nakamura on that concept of allyship. I, I really think that, you know, I have a, a Black Lives Matter um, um, uh, sign outside my house. I think the disability rights movement needs to also understand that uh, race really matters. I think there, if, if there was one problem with the disability rights movement of, of the 70s and 80s, it focused very much, I think, on, on the white educated person's um, disabled experience. And, um, you know, we know that, for example, you know, um, uh, that um, there's a huge intersectionality between um, uh, um, the type of police violence that happens to black um, men and women and disabled men and women. And the excuses that are often used for that police violence are often lie, they, they know they can't blame race, so they blame it on instead on, on uh, disability and often psychiatric uh, disability for their rationale to use uh, lethal uh, violence. So I think this next half of the movement really needs to look at intersectional disability justice to really figure out how our systems structurally combine racism and ableism. You know, many disability um, um, sort of lists of disabilities don't include things such as asthma as a disability because you know it's it's it's. Um, it's not, it doesn't fit into that model of, of who is disabled, right? If you have a list of, you know, even my, my great t-shirt, you know, it, it doesn't show um, um, uh, uh, asthma. And yet asthma is a condition that seriously affects people who are living in socioeconomic poverty and people of color. Um, you know, disability rights movement haven't addressed things like um, environmental toxins like lead paint or um, the Flint water crisis. Um, disability rights organizations have been slow on the uptake uh, against not just police violence, but the school to prison pipeline mm -hmm. and how that has used special education as a tool against black and brown bodies and minds. And so I would hope that the next 20 years of ADA really focuses um, not uh, you know, on, on, on the people who are being the most impacted by the intersections of, of ableism, racism, sexism, um, and, and homophobia. And, and I think we know who, who lie at the intersections of, of all of that. And if we can do that, if we can help address the question of those who are most impacted, right? The most, the ones who look the most unlike those in position of power, I think we can pull all of us towards um, the type of community that we want. Jenny speaking, uh, Sid, this is an area in which you have uh, spent a, a great deal of time. Tell us how you see ADA 50. Oh, I see what? ADA 50, what do we need to do to get there and be fully inclusive? 
Well, I think there are several things. Um, um, one is that, um, that we haven't talked about is I think we need to bridge the gap between um, us and them as perceived. And I think one of the advantages of the ADA has been its, um, it's demonstration um, that what's good for people with disabilities almost always is good for everybody. Um, increased access to transportation, increased access to disaster planning, um, 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 increased um, access to technology that benefits everybody. And I think we need to continue to emphasize that. Um, I was very struck by the um, emphasis that I think was um, uh, really well done on the history of the ADA. And I think we need to preserve that history. And I couldn't agree more that we need to rekindle um, the flame that is kind of flickered uh, out a bit within this generation. I had the extraordinary experience. I was in my New York office and I was talking to two of our disability rights lawyers, both of whom have disabilities. Um, and I mentioned Ed Roberts and they said, who's Ed Roberts? And to me, that just really highlighted um, the absence of the, this generation not understanding uh, the struggle. And then finally, um, um, I don't, I, I don't want to sound like one note Johnny, um, but um, um, I think we do need to continually expand um, litigation. Um, there, uh, I could walk you down a city block in New York City and um, or as many of you also would do the same and can point out 20 areas of blatant violation of the law. So I think those are some of the ways that we can march forward. This is Jenny, thank you so much, Sid. Dr. O, do you have any last comments for us looking ahead towards 8850? This is Dr. O, thank you, Jenny. I absolutely do. You know, I, I hear what everyone is saying. And there is a continuous thread through it, which people continue to mention intersectionality. They continue to mention sort of the, the shared experience of being marginalized. They continue to mention education. And, and I think that that is what ties this all together. Because too often in, in the roles that I played in academia, I see that institutions often talk about the priorities they have and how they can't be all things to all people at all times. And so when they then often bring in the financial burden of some of these things, that's how they justify not being able to then address the needs of a minority population because they feel as though they need to start by addressing the needs of the majority because the majority has a louder voice. And if the majority is unhappy, they feel as though then they have failed. But as everyone said here, if we then create something that is inclusive of and accessible to the disability community, what we are truly doing is we are supporting every single community in doing so. But because of the way that disability has been siloed, has been decentralized, has been segregated, it has caused people to then form factions around individual demographic groups. And then those people then stake their claim on this particular movement that they're supporting. But I think that this sounds simple and I know it is not, but if we can then galvanize all of the support and resources of all of these marginalized groups to represent and recognize that we are all fighting for the same thing, then all these minority groups will quickly become the majority because we will see that the intersecting thread that we are all fighting for will then give us the same access that we all deserve. I gave a TED talk at sort of at the height of the pandemic last year, and I talked about Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Now, most of us probably remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Maybe some of the, the Yale students right now will have no idea what I'm talking about. But the beginning of that show started with saying, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And then he said, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? The reason I talk about being someone's neighbor is because when people have some sort of proximity to an issue, that tends to then result in their interest in then fighting for those rights. I acknowledge that until the proximity to disability came first and foremost into my life as experiencing a disability myself, 
I did not recognize what I could have done to support that community. So I do not wish a spinal cord injury upon anyone and not everyone is going to be a black man, but you don't have to be a disabled black male physician athlete immigrant to then recognize the disparate care that we provide and the disparate access that we provide each of those marginalized communities. But if we start by educating our youth as early as we can to not see otherness as bad, if we stop splitting groups up and having people advocate for the needs of one small group minority, but we bring all of these things together and we all work together to say that whoever it is that has the need today, we are all supporting that need. We're not going to have five different groups that are then fighting for different things at the same time, because what will happen then is that the institutions that then make the decisions about the priorities will then feel as though we've been scattered and they will then pluck up something that the majority has decided is more important. But when our voices all come together to recognize that all of these marginalized groups are asking for the same thing and we support one another, then the voiceless and the faceless and those that don't have a seat at the table will all of a sudden be the majority at that table. And we can educate, advocate, and implement the things that we need to then create the equity and inclusion that we all deserve. This is Jenny. Thank you so much for those thoughts. And thank you to everyone on the panel for taking the time to share your expertise and your insight, your personal experiences, the stories of your lives. This has been a tremendous opportunity for us to really engage uh, and, and really one of the very first opportunities to be part of a, a conference like this as a full and equal partner. Um, I say so because we know that there is an alarming statistic that is uh, a fact when it comes to discussions around diversity. Um, and that is that in those kinds of discussion, uh, we have uh, determined that usually are only around 3% of these dialogues, events, conferences, summits, educational gatherings actually include people with disabilities. But what you've heard today is really about who the disability community is. You've heard about bias and stigma and marginalization, but you have heard so much more about disability pride, about the tremendous creativity, talent, and power that resides in this community. We're very grateful to have been part of this Yale Impact Summit, we need to be and intend to be always included. And if you would like more content on this subject, I encourage you to visit the Yale website and channel to learn more about the Yale Impact Conference and the other topics that have covered. But for now, I will say thank you to Henry Kwan and Yale University, my co-moderator, Ben Nadolsky, all of our tremendously talented panelists and uh, look forward to continuing a dialogue that includes disability as an equal seat at the table at all of these events going forward. Thank you and have a good afternoon.